Hello, everyone. I'm Steve Cashdollar. Welcome to the program for today. It's called How to Succeed at Selling Remotely. Welcome. And thanks uh, to Kayser and Blair, and Kirk Kayser, Scott Baker, and all the people at Kayser and Blair for helping make this possible and bringing it to you. Uh, so <clears throat> thanks for registering. As you know, there'll be four events coming up here today and for the next four Tuesdays, and uh, each with a little bit different topic, but all focused on really helping to do business to, 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 to survive <laughs> and to thrive during uh, somewhat, somewhat challenging times. So I appreciate you taking the time to think about and wanting to learn and figuring out how to be better, do better, maybe do something bigger, better, different. So welcome and uh, um, let's just get started. So there are some new trends that we see and that we read too in research from people like Salesforce, uh, Harvard Business Review, um, Forbes, and others, and things that we see too in our day-to-day -day activities, and you may too. The biggest thing now is buyers are making decisions faster, but the unique thing is they may be spending a little bit more time in the background before they get to you. By that, I mean you know, there's a lot of information out there. Are buyers more savvy today or less savvy? And we know the answer to that, don't we? They're, they're more savvy. They, 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 they can do the shopping before they even come to us. So one of the things about faster decisions is you and I need to be better. And if we're going to stand out from the competition, if we're going to survive all of this, we've got to be better. I'll talk to, to that a little bit more, but we've got to be better prepared. And we've got to stand out from the crowd. The likelihood is they may be shopping you, right? May, especially new prospects. Maybe not existing customers, but they probably are too, at least on bigger purchases. But we're talking about prospecting for new business here today in a fair amount of our program. So the other thing we've found is not just faster decisions, but more detail. That's number two in the new trends, as you see on your screen. Number two means more detail. That means, in my book, that buyers are looking for a little more, a little more detail, maybe a little more homework from you maybe a little more creativity and a little bit more about the purchase they're getting ready to make. Bigger purchases more so than maybe just a smaller purchase for you know, a box of pens or something like that. Number three is buyers are more savvy, but they also want more. They demand more. Do customers demand more now? I think so. I know I do when I'm out there shopping or eating or when I used to go out to eat. So understand, number three means that they want you, the buyer wants you to understand their business, their challenges, their problem, what they're trying to achieve. They want you to, to understand. And how, how do you understand? It's not by spilling all your candy and coming up with a million ideas and sending 100 samples. It's about hearing them out and asking them questions. How did you get started? What's this project look like? What did you do last year? Tell me a little bit more about that questioning strategies. Oh, I'm confused. Tell me again why you asked that question. Or oh, I don't understand, Steve. Or it might be, is that a big deal for you? <laughs> or how often did that happen during the year? Or I might just, I might just, uh, um, I might just soften some of my statements and ask more questions. I might say, Steve, I'll, a lot of people ask that. What brings that up today? Or that's a great question. Tell me a little bit more. What I'd like for you to do is become a little bit more of a doctor, a little less of peddling a commodity. And I don't mean that disrespectfully at all. We all have somewhat of a commodity, I suspect, because we have so much competition. But sometimes your product's seen as a commodity, isn't it? Especially with maybe a new buyer that doesn't know you and doesn't know how much energy and effort you put toward it. And creativity, too. I've seen some of the work you do. And the creativity is outstanding. So, so just make sure that you're not on just one other person out there peddling a product for 99 cents each. And sometimes we are, you know, it's a practical matter. So make sure that you stand out from the crowd. And here's a thought. If you're taking a note today, here's a great place to start. And you can always ask. I think it does something to a buyer. Do you mind if I take a note or two while we're talking? Especially on, on remote meetings and remote calls because they can't really see what you're doing. Do you mind if I take a note? It's a, it's a practical thing. It's also a common courtesy, and it shows that you're paying attention and that you can just say, I want to make sure I understand. <laughs> I love that phrase. I want to make sure I understand. You can use that. So that just means you're being the doctor or maybe the detective. Now, 
if I go to the doctor and he shows me a diploma on the wall that he's done a thousand gallbladder surgeries and he says, I think I'll take yours out or I suggest we take yours out, that doesn't do a whole lot for me. Now I'm kidding, of course, but I would rather he ask me a hundred questions to find out what really hurts and where it hurts and how long has it been hurting. I want him to really understand before he diagnoses. See if you agree. Sometimes, sometimes we prescribe too soon. I know when I've shopped, sometimes I get a, a box full of samples and it's pens and it's a calendar and it's a mouse pad and it's, uh, you, know, well, you know. So be careful, be careful. I don't want you to send me a sample of something that really clicks with me based on what you and I have talked about. Something to think about, isn't it? No disrespect intended. So be careful, understand first, then prescribe second. I think we can all learn from that because we're all excited. We got a new prospect. And we're thinking about jumping in and we want to show them how much we know. But the way you're going to show how competent you are, I'm going to run this by you again. The way you show and display how competent you are and how knowledgeable you are and how experienced you are is by the questions you ask. Number four is trust. Trust, hmm, rapport is one thing. Trust is another. Trust is more important than ever now. And we have to figure out how to build trust in a Zoom call or go to meetings, or maybe it's just a phone call that you like to use right now or have to use. People are judging, judging us fairly quickly and they're judging us on maybe a little bit more surface. If I'm in front of your desk at your office, you can see me, you can see everything from how I carry myself to perhaps what I'm wearing. You can, but on Zoom or phone, it's mostly tone of voice. And in this case, if you've got your video on, we can see each other a little bit eye to eye, but it's a challenge, isn't it? So, so trust is built, well, the research, shows, the research shows that people decide in the first three minutes, at least they start to decide in the first three minutes, maybe quicker on a Zoom or a remote call, whether they're gonna buy from you or not. Now they, they, they still need pricing and delivery and samples and some ideas and how's their logo gonna look on that on that, uh, on that cooler or what, whatever. But the, 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 the beginning of the decision is really fast. You know, we've always heard uh, first impressions happen like in you know, a few seconds. So here's the thing to think about today on these four, especially on trust, understanding trust and so forth. Just know people are making a decision pretty quick. So you wanna be ready, you wanna be prepared, you wanna be better than the average bear and you wanna be different than if, if everybody else is doing it, maybe quit doing it. So you're prepared, you've looked them up, you've seen them on LinkedIn, you've looked at their website, you've tried to understand the event that's upcoming or uh, the issue that they're trying to, to, to utilize. And if you don't, you wanna, wanna ask, ask, ask. Uh, you'll stand out from the crowd and show your intelligence, your creativity, and that you're a pro by the questions you ask. And don't, you don't have to defend yourself, just ask more questions. If, if somebody says, I'm looking at a competitor, you don't have to jump in and, you're not gonna build trust by saying, hey, we're a lot better, or we've been here 100 years. Now that's important, but most everybody else is saying, we've been here a long time, we've got the best customer service, we've got all the products available to you. That's what your competition's saying too. And so, 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 so be different. Ask questions, a little less talk, a little more action. <laughs> is that, that's a song, isn't it? I think it might be. Okay, so my daughter says, Dad, Stay hip. <laughs> I think I know what she means. One of the things that I try to do is just to stay current, but I realized that, um, I realized that over the last few years, my social networking was really, was really not uh, up to speed. Uh, one of the things we find is the, the longer we've been in business, the less we relied on social network. Uh, new professionals coming up, they grew up with it. So we put together a book called Creating a Strategic Social Network. Here's the link. I'd like for you to pick it up, it's free. And uh, if you can't get that link, we're gonna send it out to, we've got some things to send to you and you'll get this link and I would suggest getting that free ebook. Some great ideas on, as my daughter would say, staying hip. And it's really about utilizing everything we have available to us and a lot of it's very inexpensive on ways to network and to stay involved, just a thought. So take a breath there, hang in there. So here's a question for you to kind of ask for of yourself. What is the one thing that you're struggling with uh, selling remotely? 
And if you type it into the chat, we'll share some of these. If, if you had to pick one thing you're struggling with, uh, of course, now I'll go first. Uh, it seems like where I struggle a little bit with the tech. One thing I didn't always do, but I think we should, I think we should always check out our tech. If we're going to do a Zoom call, that we check it out ahead of time. And I don't always do that. I think I've done so many that I've got it down. But we should check out uh, if we're using a PowerPoint, or if you're showing pictures of sample products. Here's one. It's difficult to show custom products on a Zoom or go to meetings or online. So one of the things we know is we can take a photo with the PowerPoint like we're using today. We can share it. So we can show fairly graphic, fairly good quality photos on a call like this. Um, so it's something to think about. How can you photograph um, that custom item and how can you save it to your desktop and then uh, share it um, uh, share it as a, as a piece of um, either on a PowerPoint or some other service. PowerPoint's an easy thing to do to post, to post photos. Um, um, here's another question. It's just difficult to get people to show up on a Zoom call. Yeah, we know that. If 100 people reserve space, and I know you're not doing 100 people, but it, it, just know that it takes some reminders. People forget. Uh, they do get a lot of offers. There's a lot of offers coming along on email for meetings. Um, so make sure you're prepared. Make sure you do some reminders. And one other thing, if you're doing a remote call and you want your party to show and not to forget you or to just discount it, send uh, some things in advance. It might be, let's say, let's say you have a questionnaire that you use um, when you're in a personal meeting. Maybe it's 10 questions you'd like to ask to get to know your client better. What's upcoming? What kinds of things have you done in the past? If you don't have a questionnaire, I'd put one together. I bet you have one. And, and send that in advance of your call. And that starts to engage your buyer uh, so that they do show uh, and that they are on the phone and they're a little bit ready and they see that you're more thoughtful than the average bear who's just firing off a quote. It helps you stand out from the crowd. A couple things there. So sending in advance, communicating, uh, confirming. When you do set up the original uh, meeting, uh, there's some things you can do uh, to make sure they see that you're professional and that you're going to be ready for the meeting. We'll cover those in a minute uh, on a thing we call upfront agreement. Stand by for that. So hang on. Um, a little bit more research just to set the scene for today, if you don't mind. All crisis is temporary. We'll get through this. It may take a while. It's not short term, is it? This isn't going to be gone in a month or two, is it? So as we start to talk to, you can work your way out of a funk. You can work your way out of a crisis. The action you take now will help you work your way out. Here's some of the research. As we talk to CEOs and business owners and managers and even one man and one woman shops, here's what we're finding. This isn't real scientific. It's just sort of a cross section. And you may be finding this too when you're talking to buyers. About 20% of businesses are full speed ahead right now. I think that's increasing as time goes by. In April and May, maybe uh, uh, 20%. In July and August, that's probably going up a little bit um, as we see what we can do and what we're allowed to do or what's recommended to us for safety and health. 20% are going for it. There's about 60% of us in the middle. Um, Think about this. You probably see some buyers like this, and you may be like this. About 60% are wondering what to do now. They want to stay up. They want to keep going, but they're not sure what to do or how to do it. They're wondering what they need to do to pivot, or in this case, to make changes in their approach and their strategies and their behaviors and their attitudes, maybe even techniques. And not surprising, about 20% are sitting on the sidelines. So I talked to a financial advisor the other day who owned, uh, I, had a, I think he had about 12 advisors working with him. And in April, he asked me to call him back in 60 days. So I, I called him back. Usually when people say, call me back in a couple of months, I don't, don't, I don't like that. Usually they're just afraid to say no. So when I call back in 60 days, it's still no. <laughs> when somebody says, call me in 60 days, I think it's fair to just say, I appreciate that. I'll put you on my calendar. By the way, what's going to happen over the next 60 days that will help us uh, uh, connect better? I like to clear the air on that. No mystification uh, with a buyer who's sitting on the sidelines or is, is putting me off or let me think about it. So 20% on the sidelines, where are you in this scheme of things? And why are some people full speed ahead and one, others are sitting on the sidelines? 
we're going to talk about full speed ahead here today. But you know, full speed ahead, full speed ahead is really about three things. It's about our belief system or our attitude. Um, and attitude is the why, why we're doing things. It's our, it's our philosophy. It's our belief. So think about what your attitude is right now. That's one, one of the things you and I have control over, right? And then we always talk about behaviors. Behaviors are what I do. I make, you know, 40 phone calls uh, every morning between 10 and 12. Behavior, those are our strategies, um, our, our plans, and maybe goals. You know, I want to make uh, 20 phone calls to get two appointments. My goals, that's the what. So attitude is the, the, the philosophy or the beliefs and why you're doing it. Um, the behavior is our, our strategies and our plans and maybe some goals in there. And technique is really the skill or the, or the, the presence that I use, the, the personal attack, the how, the how I'm doing it, how I'm doing it, what I'm saying, what works, and so forth. So that's where I say we can work our way out of a crisis because these three things, attitude, behavior, technique, why, why I'm doing it, what I'm doing, and how I'm doing it are all in my control. I... Are you taking notes? Here's one. <laughs> um, I, um, I can only control certain things in my work. I can't control if you buy training from me, can I? I can't control the, that you say yes and engage with me. I can control, though, my attitude, my, my beliefs, my belief in my product, for example. I can control my behavior, my strategies and plans. I have 100% control over that. And the things I use, maybe the script I use to open up a call or the ways I like to handle that, I, that work, if there's an objection or a concern, my skills, I can control that. I can learn more. Congratulations, by the way, for learning more today. I admire you. You're my kind of people. The skills and my, my, my personal uh, effort, my techniques, all these things are under my control. So no whining, no complaining. So for the next, uh, for the next seven days, no complaining. No put downs, no whining, no complaining about the world, about the president, about, uh, about the economy, about the virus, no whining. Because the things we can do each day, we have 100% control over no matter what. Yeah, I see a couple nods and a couple smiles on that. So just think about what you need to change to, to survive and thrive these challenging times. Somebody once said, um, challenging times require massive action or Unusual times require unusual strategies. And difficult times require amazing, they require doubling down. I'll explain that in a second. So look at the things you believe. Look at some of the judgments you've made in a vacuum, maybe. I'm making a lot of judgments in a vacuum. My office is right over there down the hall and I'm landing in my upstairs and it gets a little lonely. So I, I have a business coach and I talk to people and I ask for help which is hard to do. It seems like the more gray hair I get, the harder it is to ask for help. So think about your beliefs and, and the judgments that you've made through all of this. Your beliefs, what are, you, what are you believing now? And are those beliefs even, are they even accurate? And then the actions you're taking are really a result of those two, the action or the lack of action, especially if you're in that 20% sitting on the sideline. But, you know, I thought it's interesting about 20% of your, about 20 of your uh, competitors are sitting on the sideline too. They're not calling you, your, your peeps. Uh, so if you're reaching out, you're, you're already ahead of, of almost a fourth of the competition. And then about 60% of the competition, if those numbers are anywhere clear, are not sure what to do. So you're going to get a little bit more of a game plan on, on what to do, I hope. So then that's, the, that's where the results come from. Your beliefs, your judgments, your actions. Yeah, I know the economy has some effect. The, the virus has a lot of effect on us right now, but we can't control that, right? So just to put a bow on this, this piece of our program today, um, think about pressing pause. What a, look at the things that we've said we do, networking, events, blah, blah, blah. I miss all of those, don't you? I, I, don't, I don't particularly like going to a cocktail hour to network, but networking events I love where people are, you know, there's a speaker and you can mingle a little bit, ask questions, get some stuff to take home. Uh, In-person calls. I built my whole career on stopping in. In my youth as a 30-year-old, I bought a radio station in my hometown and it was almost all built on stop-ins, except for an advertising agency or maybe a bank. We didn't have appointments. 
We stopped in at the, at the furniture store. The owner was there. We stopped in at the uh, restaurant before lunch hour and talked to the owner. We, most car dealers, the owner, we could see the owner too. Car dealers, furniture stores, those were big advertisers uh, for us. Uh, In-person stop-ins. Oh, I love doing those. Um, sometimes you'd make a sales presentation standing by the cash register, and that was awful. Uh, but sometimes that's what we did. Um, so, but, but today it's all new. I mean, not all new, but video. We've been, in the last three months, we probably did 100 video sessions. Well, you get a PhD really quick to step into it. Social selling, pretty new to us in the overall scheme of things. Uh, cold calling, have you had to revisit? Uh, I work with a group of realtors uh, in Indiana and the top realtor told me the other day, I said, how do you do it? How, Cause her numbers were still record setting. She said, Steve, I just went back to the things I did 30 years ago to start. I said, like what? And she said, like, just t- talking to everybody. She said, if I go through the drive through at Starbucks, I ask them if they know anybody that's looking for a house. <laughs> and this was a millionaire who had a, a big team of marketers. Uh, she went back to cold calling and some cold emailing, but just talking to everybody about what she does. I thought that was pretty interesting. Now, there's one other one I'll highlight here for a second. It's called thought leadership. This is something you can do. How many of you have more extra time now than you than maybe you had a year ago, more free time? Most of us do because we're not commuting, we're not flying, we're not driving, we're not sitting in lobbies waiting for meetings. The thought leadership is where you start to develop, and this is something maybe you can do with a little bit of that extra time you have, that, that's not windshield time. Thought leadership for me, for example, would be uh, writing a book, uh, posting a blog, uh, recording some videos, um, writing an article for the local business magazine, doing some, 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 some pre- presentations, uh, speaking to some virtual events. Thought leadership is where you put yourself out there as an expert. And you can do it by writing or speaking or putting together a booklet. An ebook is pretty easy to put together. And you start to develop yourself above and beyond. I don't want to say this wrong. So you're not, you're not a peddler anymore. That's nothing wrong with peddler. Uh, I love peddlers. But you can be a, a peddler plus. And a peddler plus is somebody who's recognized as being out there and being one of the most knowledgeable. And it also helps you go from from being just another competitor to somebody who's engaged, who's smarter, who's more creative, who's communicating with his world, his or her world. That's called thought leadership. So you know some thought leaders. You might follow them online. And is there something you can do on your website? Maybe it's just a newsletter. Not just, but maybe it's a newsletter. Um, Thought leaders. Uh, You can become a little bit of a thought leader by posting uh, creative and uh, helpful ideas on your LinkedIn. So you want to be on LinkedIn, of course, and you want to be in the social media. So when people look you up, your new behavior is starting to show up. Your buyers mostly check you out before they reach out to you or they check you out after you've reached out to them. You know that. We all check people out. Did anybody check me out before you registered or before you came on today? Yep, I know you did. People are checking you out. You want to be there. And ask ask some friends as you're starting to do more remote Ask some friends or somebody you trust, maybe even a customer or two, or another Kayser and Blair dealer, how your stuff looks. Go to your website, get feedback from that person and um, somebody who will be honest with you. How does your LinkedIn page look? Ask a friend or a neighbor or somebody who will give you an honest answer. I like to ask my customers too. How did that look? My sister's my sounding board. She's a super skeptic. She's a realtor in Ohio. I'll say, hey, Barb, what does this look like? And she'll unload on me. She's pretty honest, too honest sometimes. So make sure your web information and the things you're using to build your relationships make a great impression. And it's often somebody else with a set, separate set of eyes that'll find things that you didn't see. Um, more competition today, you gotta be better. You wanna stand out from the crowd. They, I want them to choose you, not somebody else. Making decisions faster and we need trust, a lot of trust today, so, okay. I just want to say one thing. Um, Somebody says it's difficult to make to build relationships online because it's not eye to eye. Yeah. So, so there's different ways to win in this environment. Uh, That was a good thought, by the way, on the chat. Um, 
for example, a year ago, I would call a win in my business, um, having left a meeting with a contract and a deposit and the plans to work together for three years um, and, a, and a roughed out idea of what we were going to do and when. That was a win. But today, sometimes a win, today is a win. Getting a chance to meet you, connect with more Kayser and Blair dealers, uh, try to bring some ideas. And if we, if we start to build our relationship, even if it's gradual, to me, that's a superior win, right? So it's a little different, even though people are making decisions quickly today, um, it, the, the, the road to those decisions is a little bit different, isn't it? So, so think about what a win is for you. Now, the reason this is so important, guys, is that we need some success along the way here because adults need some success every 60 to 90 days. If we go, if we go without a hit, <laughs> if we go over 20, and sometimes we do, we start to question everything we're doing. Um, if I'm a, a, if I'm a batter and I've gone over 40, I'm starting to wonder if my stance is right. So I might change it or I may be fiddling with it a little bit. I definitely fiddle with my golf swing. Don't you? So, so think about, is it worth, should you, should you fiddle with it or is it just the environment and what can I do to adjust and not throw everything out just because it's a little more difficult today? I'll give you an example, maybe standing out from the crowd. Since it's a remote meeting, typically today, we have time usually, and maybe more time to prepare. Would you say that's that's true? Linda says more time to prepare, more time. People are more relaxed. It's a little bit more relaxed uh, setting on a remote call, especially if it's a phone call or a Zoom. Free call strategies. I always invite your people if you're going to do a, a, a call like this on go to meetings or something. Uh, always that, give give some rules of the road before you come to the meeting. One would be, don't forget to turn on your audio and don't forget to turn on your video so we can have a more lifelike meeting. When people turn on the video, they're more engaged. You can be more engaged. You'll build more trust video to video. Uh, so one of the pre-call things is to ask for that. Some people don't like to turn on the video. It's uncomfortable to them. But if you mention, I'll have my video on, and you ask them to turn their video on, even if it's a bad hair day, most people will. So pre-call planning also includes a lot of things like uh, looking me up on LinkedIn, looking at my website, uh, going, uh, going to my industry and finding out some things that are going on in my world. Um, be better, be better prepared as opposed to just ready to fire off a quote. Now, we're going to do a breakout session here in a minute about your ideal client profiles. The breakout sessions don't appear on the video recording, so we'll connect back in a few minutes. But here's what I want you to think about. This is part of making change. I say, who do you best serve during these times? Who you best serve might be different now than it was. So if you were best serving people doing meetings and events that have been canceled, has that changed? Does it have, does it have to change? I get, you know, an example we saw that Bob sent out uh, last week was with the Kayser and Blair dealer who sold 4,000 bags. And in those bags that went to schools, there were safety items, reminder items, and a couple fun items for each kid. Each kid, each kid got a, a take home bag, a safety bag. I don't think they called it that, but had safety items in it like masks and some, some guides and some other things, some fun things. So, so who that dealer served might have changed. Now they were working with the school before I understood, but the things they were probably doing were probably handouts at a football game, you know, shakers or megaphones or something like that. So, so what that way that what they were doing and what they are now doing has changed. So their ideal client profile has changed. Um, somebody mentioned earlier on one of the chats that they were that their business was selling calendars and, and people weren't willing to to buy calendars now. And there were two suggestions on the chat. One was how about a calendar with a safety message or some tips, a health and safety kinds of calendar. And then somebody else said, uh, I think it was Bruce said, um, think about maybe they're they're worried about how they'll distribute the calendars. So come up with a distribution plan. Maybe there's a different way to distribute them distribute them some other way. I'm not sure what that is, but I'm sure there's a way. So what, so, so what are the pains? What are the things that your client's going through and be a problem solver? If there's a problem and you can solve it, you've probably got a customer. 
And then the other thing is, what are their trigger events? Do you know what I mean by that? A trigger event. Well, a trigger, we're all dealing with trigger events now, aren't we? Uh, trigger events would be some, what, what triggers a need to get better communication or some marketing or another connection with their clients. And, and I don't know exactly what those are for each industry, but that's something to ask. What's creating that? Or what's your biggest concern now? Or what actions do you want to take now? What, what kinds of things do you want to say to your clients? And what we're saying to our clients is different. So, so readjust what that ideal client is and what you're doing or what you're used to do to maybe what you could do or should do. I have milk delivered now in an old fashioned dairy that delivers milk in glass bottles, like in the, in, in the, in the sixties, fifties and sixties and beyond. And uh, they uh, ask you to put something out to, so they can put their milk in it to keep it cool. So like I have, I have these bags and I'll put a big thing of uh, like an ice frozen thing in to keep it cool. And they drop off a, sort of a small, bag, uh, insulated bag, not real expensive with their name on it that I can put my, uh, my, they can put my bottles in. They don't provide them like they did back in the day. So I thought that was clever, a little bit expensive for them, but there's a brand new client that wasn't even around what two years ago, milk delivery. It was to a certain extent, but now it's booming. Their business is booming. I get vegetables delivered, milk delivered, seafood delivered. Um, uh, and they, they all, so delivery companies, of no matter what they're delivering, are one of the hottest items for you. Um, here's some other hot items that I'll flash on the screen. And those that you're listening only, I'll, I guess maybe I could read these off. You'll have a booklet coming to you that we prepared with 101 of the, the highest prospect customers for promotional items that are booming now. Uh, cleaning companies, schools, emergency communication, software companies. I'll give you an example there. I work with a company called Everbridge and they have, um, if you're in Boston, look them up. Everbridge produces software that communicates when there's something going wrong. Like Federal Express, let's say there's a driver that's been held hostage in New Orleans and they want the, all the depots in Louisiana to know and to be careful and have their drivers on the lookout. That software communicates that kind of thing. And uh, their business is booming. So they, you know, maybe they offer a high beam, high intensity, small flashlight for their drivers, FedEx drivers who are working before and after the sun, before the sun comes up and after the sun, you know, just things. So home delivery, I say milk, uh, farms, um, restaurant delivery and so forth. Um, um, gardening products are big. Anybody know anyone who started a garden this year for the first time in a long time? Gardening products, home entertainment products, kitchen products. Everybody's cooking more, eating at home all the time, most of the time. And you know, one that's huge. Have you driven by a Lowe's or a Home Depot lately? The Lowe's nearest my home, the parking lot is just almost 100% full every day. People staying home, nesting, fixing up their houses. Instead of taking a vacation and flying to Florida, they're fixing up their spare room or putting on a screened in porch or whatever. Uh, so 101 uh, prospects coming your way in the next day or two is an ebook that we promised to you. I hope you appreciate that. So we're going to send everybody to a breakout room. You're going to be in the room with about four other people. And I want you just to share with each other a little bit about your ideal client and maybe what's changed with them and what you think you could do. Or if somebody in your group has an ideal client, like, like the, the calendar client, what could you do if calendars are sort of on the back burner right now? And like Bruce's idea to figure out a distribution plan and Linda's idea of, uh, is there a health oriented uh, calendar that would still work? So share those ideas for a little bit and then we'll call you back in. Here you go. We'll give you 60 second warning when the session's over. Okay. Thanks for that. So we're talking about social selling and re remote selling and how we can stay after these new opportunities. Um, and here's the link again for the resources on social network. If you missed it before, I'll let you take a minute there. And we're going to send that separately too. So one of the things that came up on the chats that I sat in on, breakout rooms, it was how, how to reach out, how to prospect now. We don't want to be tone deaf, do we? 
And some, some of the 20% of people that are sitting on the sidelines are afraid of being tone deaf. By that, I mean that they're too, they don't want to be too aggressive when there's illnesses out there and they don't want to be the only one that's prospecting. And they don't sort of make cold calls now and who's buying and are we interrupting? And there's something that, uh, that, that uh, you were talking about on emailing your clients. We tested something a couple of weeks ago where we used a, a short subject line and this really worked and it generated meetings. So you might try this. Here's a suggestion. Pick 10 of your recent uh, prospects, 10 or 20 or 30, however many you like, at least 10, and send them an email. These would be people that said, uh, check back with me, or I'm going to think about it. Or for one reason or another, you started to build a relationship, and then they, they pulled in the reins and stopped. So short subject lines work. So something like this. Anything changed? Question mark. Anything changed? Question mark. That's all it takes. So that gets opened. And then just three sentences, three to four sentences at the most. A quick introduction. Hi, this is Steve. You know, we talked a, we talked a month ago about uh, your customer appreciation uh, efforts this year. Are you still looking at that? Or are you still considering it? Or should we revisit it? Or as a conversation warranted, you put it in your own language. So it's a unique selling proposition and ask, should we meet? Would you like to have a call? Could I give you a call tomorrow? Would you like to set a time to chat? Anything changed? So you're, we call it um, recapturing back to anybody who said no or maybe and the door wasn't closed hard, it's still open a crack. And uh, the chances are you'll rekindle some business. Of course, the more you send, the better. Anything changed in the subject line? Give that a try. Send me an email. If that works for you, I'd be anxious to see who tries it and who gets results. We got results uh, doing just that simple thing. Uh, Steve.cashdollar at Sandler.com. I'd like to hear from you uh, on that issue. So the other thing we've learned about setting up remote meetings and being able to deal with remote issues is to, you know, to, to send regular emails. And you're probably doing that. We use constant contact where we can just write an email, put our list in. We can send it, we can create maybe one or two or three follow-ups, maybe every week or every other week uh, to that request or that offer, if you will. And it's automated, so we don't have to hand, hand, handle it every time. If you don't do that kind of thing, you can look at uh, something like constant contact. Some, sometimes we'll make uh, 20 calls in a day when we almost always leave a voicemail. It's not very long, but we'll send an email. So it looks like a call, I left a message on the voicemail, a quick email that's already prepared. We just click on it and send it. So we're not creating emails on every call. And then um, and a voicemail. And so call, voicemail, email, and then do it again. And we, we, may we may do four or five or six or seven attempts over a couple of weeks, not to pester, but just to start to build a relationship and be there. And, and when we do send emails, we try to just bring value. It's not always selling, selling, selling. Sometimes it's just value, content, value, content. I know you get emails like that. It's part of how you become a thought leader like we talked about before. Now, some experts say when you see some post or somebody responds to a website um, or you get a response maybe to an email or a direct mail or something else to respond quickly um, within five minutes. So I see the value in that you could judge that. Um, and then there's one other thing, um, when we uh, are making our phone calls to reach out remotely, um, we teach this in some of our workshops um, to engage with the gatekeeper. You know, nobody's taking phone calls right now, are they? So we get gatekeepers a lot. So the thing we teach, and I know you would do this, was we're always 100% respectful to a gatekeeper. We get their name, we ask a couple questions, but they can't be phony questions, they have to be authentic. And we build a relationship because likelihood is if we call back, we're going to get that gatekeeper again. So nothing tricky. Don't try to sneak past the gatekeeper. Not today. Remember, we're building trust. And something to think about as you're doing maybe more phoning today and fewer events, fewer networking events, fewer stop-ins, is your gatekeeper is your friend. So, so make sure that uh, they understand uh, that you're different than all the other people. They may field 10 calls, 20 calls, 50 calls a day. Do you know, the gatekeepers tell us that they can, they judge, they know it's a sales call that within three, four, five, six seconds. How do they do that? It's because of the way we call. Hey, hi, Emily, this is Steve. How are you doing today? I wonder, 
um, uh, could I talk to Kurt? <laughs> Do you think I could squeeze in a call to Kurt? <laughs> this the tone, it's the pace, it's too friendly, it's too salesy. So just keep your tone on an equal business stature. It's one business person calling out to another person. It's a one owner to another owner. So keep your tone steady, keep it calm, keep it very professional. You don't have to tell a joke and it should be authentic. It has to be because you're judged, boom, just like that. Whew, it's a lot, isn't it? So let's talk a little bit about being better prepared. You know, when I'm cranking out, I don't crank out a hundred calls. I'd rather call 10 people in a day and be prepared for those. So where I've, I've looked them up, I know who they are. They're my ideal client. I know where they work. I know what the products are. I know who their distribution is. I know what's going on in their industry. Now, I don't get to use all that stuff on every call, but if it comes up, I know it. And that's how I help stand out from the crowd. That's how I become a thought leader and an expert. We call it equal business stature. See, right now we're calling, we're the peddler and we're calling the CEO and it changes the dyna dynamic. So when we call as an equal owner to owner or business executive to executive or just person to person, but, but to do that, we have to be more prepared than the average bear or your, com your average competition. So what are you trying to accomplish? I might be calling, I'll tell you why I said that. When I make a phone call, I'm just calling to see if I can set an appointment. I'm not calling to ask questions and present and pitch and ask for the order. Now your business is a little different, a little more transactional than mine, where a person might spend, a company might spend 30, 50, $100,000 over a year or two or three, and you might have a $2,000 order or a $150 order. So a little bit more transactional, but, but still, still the need to understand that maybe that phone call should be a polite call and respectful. So if you get an appointment, stop and move on and, and set an appointment for 30 minutes tomorrow. So I always say we're calling for an appointment. Does that suit you? And then who will participate in that appointment? So if somebody might say, yeah, I'll set that up. And I want to make sure the owner or the decision maker is there if I can. So I might say, Nancy, who else will be on the call tomorrow? And is this, a, and is Kurt, is Kurt available to sit in? And would there be anybody else? so that I can be prepared for that. You know, did you ever go to a meeting in person and you get there and there's five people sitting around the table, you don't have a clue who they are. And is one of these guys the owner, you know? Um, and I always do it on my pre-call and then when I'm setting an appointment, I said, when we, I call back tomorrow, uh, Kurt, would it be possible to take about 20 minutes? Would that be okay for you? If I need an hour, I'll ask for an hour. Typically this first call, Kurt, takes about 60 minutes. Is that okay with you tomorrow? We, more, more if we need. And then, and then to sort of come to an agreement uh, that tomorrow we may not make a decision, but could, at the end of the 50 minutes, if we could just decide if there is a next step and what that next step might look like. Would you be okay with that focus on tomorrow's call, Kurt? So it's a little more involved, a little more organized. So as you think about some of these things, what's your biggest concern about your next online meeting or your next remote meeting? Take a minute and chat chat it in the chat and we'll share some of these. What's your biggest concern? No shows. <laughs> yeah. That's why you want to reach out in between. Maybe a questionnaire, something to think about. Maybe it's an assessment that you send. Um, maybe it's a couple success stories. Uh, I always try to connect in between because if you just set the meeting and then you show up three days later or two weeks later, whew, so you, um, Harder to connect, no eye contact, yeah, big, big concern. This is new to us. So almost every professional does some rehearsing. You know, how long, do they, how long did they work on Hamilton and rehearse that before it rolled out on Broadway? Uh, months. Um, salespeople are the only professions that don't practice. Now, some of us do role play. We do a lot of that in our training. So I would suggest if you're going to do a meeting and maybe there's an owner going to be on and a marketing person going to be on your call or maybe more, or maybe it's just one person that you do a dry run with somebody. So that could be with a spouse or a friend or coworker, or maybe another customer that's friendly and, 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 and do a dry run. You can check out the tech, check out how you sound, think about recording it. Ew. <laughs> that's scary. 
if you record it, then you're like a pro football team that's watching the video on Monday mornings of their game and they find out where they missed the tackles or, or what happened to their defense or who missed the engagement or why did the receiver do a square left when he was supposed to do a zing right. <laughs> you can revisit what happened and we don't do that much in selling. So the biggest concern I believe comes from, and some of the things you're chatting, comes from lack of preparation or lack of practice or um, just fear, <laughs> fear that it's going to go well. And the chances are it'll go better if you practice it. So figure out a way to practice and record and review what you're doing and debrief with someone. And that's the neat thing about Zoom calls and go to meetings and so forth. Um, you can look at them later. Um, now, I would suggest that on your next meeting, you attempt to do a Zoom or a go to meetings. Start to ask for Vir virtual video meetings as opposed to phone calls. So if I were going to set an appointment with you today on the phone and we're going to talk on Friday, I would say, are you okay with the Zoom meeting? I'll send you an invitation. Boom. Then it's on record. The Zoom meeting can go to their Outlook and their calendar if they're, if they're that organized and most people are today. And then you can start to get some practice. The more of these you do, the better you get at it, the more fun they are. And it's not just the voice and tone of voice on the phone. You can see how you look. Now, Whew. Think about how you look on your Zoom meeting or on your video call. So sometimes people don't think about the backdrop. Today we're just using a plain backdrop, so it can't get into too much trouble, so it's not blurry, and it's sort of a close shot anyway. We have a couple of lights that light it up, so you don't want to be in the dark. You don't want to have your camera way up like this where your head's sort of off the camera. You don't want to be looking at somebody's fan in the window if you can help it. So just make sure how, how, how it looks and how it appears so that they're focused on you. And if there's stuff in the background, that's fine. A bookshelf works pretty well. A, a fireplace can work pretty well. Um, maybe not too too cluttered. Some people will do them outdoors where it's a background. And on Zoom, you can also pick a, a backdrop to click on if you want an ocean view or a mountain view. I think those are a little bit overdone these days, but they're kind of fun. And sometimes people will engage and say, what is that in the background there, Steve? Are you sailing? <laughs> and I'll say, yeah, that's the Atlantic Ocean. We were about 10 miles out. So you can have some fun with that. And it's probably better than just this plain old thing we're using today. But that's just my choice. And I like it that way. So make sure you look to see how you look and um, it's best maybe not to have uh, a t-shirt on. Um, I will say one day I was doing a meeting with somebody that was selling me some stuff and I got up kind of late and I forgot about it. So I went downstairs in a pair of shorts that I sleep in and I put on a shirt and a sweater, but waist down it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't too professional. And I, I, had to, I had to get up and touch something and I walked out and he could see and he didn't say anything, but he said, Steve, you know, last week when we were on it, was that, was that underwear? Or was that just a pair of golf shorts? <laughs> if, oh, uh, so I should have known better. So we talked about this thing called upfront. When you're doing remote selling, it's good to be a little bit more organized a little more professional, like you've done this before, even though you might be new at it. So we call it an upfront contract, upfront agreement where we, before a phone call or before an online meeting and, and before the next meeting, and it looks like this. It's four pieces to it, A-N-O-T. If you're taking notes, this is a great place to start. An upfront is where we always, let's say, uh, let's say we've had a call and you've agreed to, you've agreed to meet, and we're gonna set a meeting on Zoom. Uh, Friday. So I have four things I'm going to do. I'm going to appreciate it. I might say, Nancy, I appreciate a, I appreciate you doing this. Thanks for setting it up. Uh, appreciate you taking the time. I look forward to talking to you tomorrow. Uh, the N A N O T is the acronym. The N is naturally you're going to have some questions. Whoops. Naturally you're going to have some questions and I want you to be able to take enough time to ask all your questions and we'll answer them. And if we don't have answers, we'll get them for you. Is that okay? And, um, and then obviously I'm going to have questions. O A N O T. The O is obviously I'm going to have some questions, but my questions aren't designed to be necessarily intrusive, but or nosy just to be, make sure I understand kind of the things you're going through, what you're concerned about and, and what we're, you know, the things we're going to try to do to help you. Fair enough. Yeah. And uh, typically that first meeting takes about 40 minutes. Nancy, is that okay with you? If we take about 40, we can take a little longer if we need or set another meeting if we need a lot more, if you could save, 40 minutes tomorrow. Is that, is that fair? Yes, fair. So 
And then, so that's, that's an upfront agreement. We're agreeing on what it's going to be. You don't want to be on the phone and they're expecting a dog and pony show when you're still discovering and trying to figure out what you should put together for that. Or if you're going to do your dog and pony show, then that, at least they know that that's what's coming. And the reason this is so important to do a little upfront, you could call it creating an agenda, is so people know what to expect. Are people really relaxed when you're making a sales presentation to them? Or are they more anxious? Nah, more anxious. Is there any trust built yet? No, probably not. This builds trust because you look more professional. You're setting the scene and you're taking control of the call. And people say, well, that's organized. I wish I could get my salespeople to do that. <laughs> Up front, think about how you could do that on every meeting, before every meeting. And when I get to the meeting, I'm going to go through it again. It might look something like this. Uh, Steve, thanks again for inviting me in, or thanks again for doing the Zoom call. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's, it's kind of fun to be able to connect during these difficult times and still have a little bit of face-to-face, uh, -face and I appreciate it. And thanks for turning on your camera. Uh, so thanks again. Uh, naturally, you're going to have your questions, and I want you to, you can go first if you like and ask away, and, uh, and there's no, no bad question. And obviously, I'm going to have I'm going to have some questions designed to just understand and try to figure out if we're a good match for you. And it is 40 minutes still okay? A-N-O-T. Appreciate, naturally, obviously, time. Now, there's one other thing that you can do on remote meetings. There's a lot going into getting ready for a remote meeting, isn't there? So why not talk about the outcome that you would like to have or that you both would like to have at the end of the 40 minutes? Most salespeople do not do this. So if you want to stand out from the crowd, describe, describe what's a successful meeting. You don't have to say it that way, but I might say, you know, you know, Ben, uh, I, if it's all right with you, my, my hope would be at the end of the 40 minutes that we have an idea uh, that if there's, that there could or should be a next step. And we may not know exactly what that looks like, but that if there isn't a next step that we could both agree to it, would you be comfortable with if, if it is no, uh, that you would, you would tell me and, and, and if I think it's not a match and I'll say no, is that okay if we have that agreement for today? And then the, really just ideally, if, if it's yes and we move forward, yeah, that's great. And that would be wonderful. But if it's maybe or no that we talk about that and we settle that before the end of the 40 minutes, that way we don't, uh, uh, we don't, uh, we don't stay hanging somewhere. I wouldn't say it that way, but you know what I mean. So, so that's part of rapport building on a remote call and before a remote call. See, when you're in a meeting and you come into my office and you see a swordfish on the wall, you've got to talk about that, aren't you? The problem with that is every salesperson that comes in talks about the darn sailfish. And it's not authentic. Hey, I like to fish too, Carl. Hey, where would you catch that? You know, everybody says the same thing. So what we would rather do, you can still chat and make friends. If you find out your buyer went to Indiana and you went to Indiana, it's okay. You're going to chat. But I would rather you use these connectors and do it from your homework. So I want to connect with the buyer, find out what they're doing, and maybe where they came from and what their work is. I want to talk a little bit about their company. So what... So what's happening, what's happening in the training industry, Steve? And in your marketplace, I know you spend a fair amount of time with blah, blah, blah. Uh, how has all this affected you? And I noticed an article, by the way, you know, this is not going to happen in three seconds. I noticed an article about the training industry uh, in a magazine that I read that uh, there's a tremendous growth um, in that arena. So we're just using these modifiers to connect better and maybe more business-like. And as long as it's authentic and as long as you've done some homework, uh, that'll certainly pay off for you. And you could... I'm the only one that talked in our group. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. you did well. Well, I've stepped out of the box. Steve, I'm not in the same box I was several months ago. You know, I mean, I, I've been doing this industry for, gosh, over 25 years now. And it's changed so much just in the past few months. I mean, from pens and sticky notes and calendars and stuff like that. I mean, I just wrote my largest order ever and in this industry, and it all was disposable mask. Mm. Hmm. Who, uh, what, uh, do you mind, what kind of client was it? It is a HVAC company. 
service uh, company. Uh, mats for them to use or to give to their clients? Or? It's for them, for their people to use. Ah, I love now, that. Now, the individually wrapped masks are for them to give to their clients when they go on a call. So uh, yeah. um, they are really taking, you know, taking the use, you know, protection to a high level. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have their own safety group. So they're pretty, yeah. pretty widespread. Yeah. And that yeah, good. congratulations you know, on that. Anybody else? Uh, Linda, did you want to? No, I just, I was just in the same group as uh, Jessica. And that was what I was going to say is that I learned a lot about stepping out of my comfort zone because I've been scared to death on PPE and masks and so many options and what to do. But she kind of gave me a good, uh, a little education on not being afraid uh, and getting out there. So I appreciated it. Just you know, Linda, like much. I told you, I asked a lot of questions. I found some other dealers that are in California that mm -hmm. we have actually become very close friends now, you know, through Facebook and different ways. And I just ask them now, if I have a question, I go, Hey, who are you using? Right. I text them and ask because the best way to find out anything is to ask somebody who's who you see is already doing it. Right. And that's what I did. I just went to them and I said, Hey, who are y'all using? And I got a lot of responses. Plus I'm in that Facebook page. That's promotional products, PPE page. And I go in there and I put out a lot. I put it on our page, our official Kayser and Blair page. I put out on there, hey, looking for. And I, I take all those responses, and then I see the companies that I know because of being in this industry, and I've worked on both sides of the industry. I've been a supply on the supplier side, too. I look at all that, and I go, okay, I know this company. And I also look on Sage because if they're not an A-plus company, or even I'll use some B companies. But I really like the A's and the A-plus rated companies because a lot of them I know, like High Caliber, you know, Logo Mark. I mean, these are companies that have been in the industry a long time. Mm -hmm. So I look at them. You know, I know that they're going to stand behind whatever I buy from them. I have no fears. Prentice, you look like you might have a thought. Do you, you want to weigh in? I'm sorry, who was that? Prentice? I might, that might be looking at a still. Uh, for him. Uh, who else? Anyone want to raise their hand, share what you heard? Uh, Linda, go ahead. I actually, you know, early on, um, you know, we've been in the business for those of us have been in it for quite some time, you know, me too, over 25 years, we're in the business of selling fun. And we got thrown into an arena and a circus that we didn't have the skill set for. So we were left to our own to educate ourselves of, you know, mask and, and, you know, it's very rare that someone's life depended on the product that we sell. And now you feel kind of a, an obligation to be the expert. Um, I didn't become a doctor because I, that's not my skill set, but to try to figure out which suppliers were offering quality products with meeting the safety protocols that were in place, it's scary. And it would have been nice to have some support of like, you know, even suppliers, they were scrambling and pivoting to kind of become the experts as well. Um, some of that's leveled out in the Facebook group and one another helping one another, but having someone that could guide you and know, here's our preferred list of vendors of, you know, for masks and stuff like that, especially in the beginning, um, would have been extremely helpful for us to kind of capture the only money that was being sent, spent. Um, but again, that Facebook group's been very helpful and, you know, hopefully someday we'll get back to selling the fun stuff. But for now, you know, the PPE is definitely ruling what's selling. Yeah. Uh, Robert, you're unmuted. Did you want to share Robert Kahn? Well, um, I'll just tell you what I've been having trouble with uh, okay. customers. I sell a lot of calendars and uh, customers this year, customers that have been buying from me for years and years are reluctant to buy this year. And uh, I haven't really figured out how to convince them otherwise. But sometimes it has to do with the companies, their business is down. Yep. So they find calendars as an area to cut. Anybody have a thought for him on calendars? 
I haven't sold a calendar in a while, so I just don't. I mean, I when all this took place, I started looking at where people were going to have to buy, and calendars is calendars is they're great. And I was brought up in the era where calendars are repeat business. They always will be. But I have taken people off of calendars and popcorn and Christmas cards to an item that is usable because they want something. And it's also going to tech right now. I mean, technical things are coming into play and the tech industry is going crazy. I mean, Besides PPE, you got tech. And so I have a want something that they can, you know, send out easily and give out easily. I, uh, I, have I, get, uh, I get my milk delivered now. Uh, I get almost all my food delivered. I get glass bottles like my dad used to, to fill when he was in the dairy business. And the dairy, uh, the dairy, uh, local dairy, um, I've been drinking more chocolate milk than I ever have in my life, you know. <laughs> I don't know why it's so darn good in that glass bottle. Uh, uh, it's a lot different than it was than it is in the store. Yeah, yeah seems to <laughs> I grew up with that. Steve. They uh, they they uh, they gave us um, a small uh, cooler. Um, I know in the old days there was boxes on our front porches when my dad did it, but now you have to put your own cooler out because they come at like two in the morning or four in the morning, and if you don't get going until eight, the you know. So they give a little nice little thing with their. I thought that was uh, uh, ingenious, really. Not ingenious, but uh, I mean, I you know I was putting out you know, like bags and stuff and sticking ice in them. So it was just a. There's always a way. There's always a company that needs something, and I think it's just that maybe easy for me to say, but I see people using promotional products now in my world, uh, my dentist, uh, safety issues, uh, the, the milk company to keep the milk cold that they deliver because they don't provide a box like they did back in the 60s when I remember that happening. Uh, we kept one on our porch, but they provided they don't do that. And they also charge to deliver now. Uh, I also get delivery from vegetables and we've got a seafood delivery. Uh, these co delivery companies, by the way, are one of the top uh, 10 in uh, prospering businesses right now. We're gonna send you a booklet called 101 Businesses That Are Prospect, uh, Prospects That Are that are Booming or something like that. You're gonna get that in a day or so, but the, one of the top 10, I'm gonna show you those in a minute. One of the top 10 is delivery. Um, software, delivery, cleaning, um, schools. Uh, I can't remember them all, I'll show it to uh, you. Anything dealing with, with cleaning products and yeah. you know, that kind of stuff right now is very, they're using yeah. it. So you got to put your thinking cap on and say, well, how do I pivot a little bit here? Maybe calendars, but those people that bought calendars might have another need right now and they just need the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Good luck with that, Robert. And reach out for, reach out and ask for help. Let's okay. see anybody else unmuted here. You boy, you know, you're going to get called on if you unmuted. Uh, I, I like sticky notes because they're, we're home now. And everybody's writing notes everywhere and it's always going to be in their desk. So I'm doing a lot of sticky notes. Yeah. Who's who's speaking? I don't see you. Oh, I was. Ken? Yeah. Uh, yeah, sticky notes. I was just thinking that too. Um, um, shopping list. One of the things I found is in my daughter's doing, we just have one person that's doing shopping and it's her husband mostly. And uh, we, he has, I have a two-year-old grandson. So we're really super diligent about, you know, mingling. Maybe, maybe, maybe we're overreacting a little bit, but I don't think so. So they, they, since we're only going to the store, say, every other week, and we're going late at night when there's not so many people in the market, they're keeping a list now on their, uh, on their refrigerator like we all do, I guess, or we, sometimes we do, so that they don't go and forget. Because, you know, in the old days, we just run back to the store or we go about every other day. Do you guys ever do that in your, in your life? Just every yes. time you need something, if you're close, you just go. But we don't want to do that, just more exposure. So I see food companies or supermarkets with uh, refrigerator stickers or maybe even calendars to mark the day or to mark the day when, uh, when, when the toilet paper <laughs> arrives or something like that. Um, let's see, anybody else I'm gonna, like, this, anybody else wanna weigh in here? Yeah, I'll go, I'm Audrey, um, Cleveland, Ohio. Hi. I had a, hi everyone, I had a question for folks. Um, the most of the business that I lost were um, associated with events. And I wanted to know if anyone who had customers that pivoted while they were doing virtual events, and if they did, how did they make that distribution? Because that was that would be an extra cost. Anyone? 
So depending on what the item is in the distribution, some of the ideas that I discussed with my clients was if they're not setting up vendor fees and traveling expenses, the savings mm -hmm. that from not being in person at a live event may be able to counteract some of the shipping costs. So um, ask them what fees they were originally putting out and see if you can come up with a plan for distributing the item and drop shipping. Some vendors are even waiving drop shipping fees. So you might be able to kind of offset that budget that is no longer needed for in-person events. Yeah. Okay, thanks. That sounds good. Yeah, and I go. have a lot of uh, associations and event people also. Mm -hmm. And what's happening is they're obviously not holding in person, but they're doing virtual um, award ceremonies. And so they're still doing all of the awards and things, but we're sending them to the uh, recipient's home. And then they're also sending thank you little gifty type things to each of their uh, of their people who attend the uh, virtual um, event. So that's been real nice with uh, things like coasters and things like things that are permanent that will remind them of the event. Yeah, very good. Okay. Thank you. Thanks both of you. Uh, yeah, we're going to go over a little bit here. If you ha if somebody has to leave, I understand, but we're going to go over just a little bit and stay, stick stick with you with us if you can. Mm -hmm. um, um, somebody said, uh, let's see, Robert, uh, you might you might find that people are wondering how they will distribute their calendars this year. Um, I would say they're probably going to have to mail them. If that's it, develop a distribution plan for them. How do yeah. they get them out? Um, that sure. was a good point from from Bruce. Um, uh, Alisa, Alisa said, in this environment, what do you think is the best approach to gain a new customer? Anybody want to answer that? What's the best approach to gain a new customer? I would go to social media. I mean, I, that's the first time I've ever gotten the client off social media, but it paid off. It was just, I, I find maybe, you know, doing some, I mean, I even had one that came off of, and this was an individual, I sold her face mask and all I did was put up a flyer. I did a flyer on, on my Facebook page through word. Very good. Linda, Linda M said, uh, you may be able to find a safe and health themed calendar that would be appropriate for this year. Distribution is uh, so health, uh, health and, and, and uh, health, health and, health and safety health themed health. calendar, as opposed to maybe a sports calendar or right. it's uh, a good dogs one. or cats or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, so some people, so that's, so that's that. So um, let me just say this. Um, we're going to, we'll, we'll close it out here in a minute. You can, here's a quote that I wrote down. If you're taking notes, you can behave your way out of this. Actually, it says you can behave your way out of a funk. <laughs> if behavior, attitude, and action. Um, because it, we're all, we can all get, we can all be funk like right now. I know I've had days where I didn't know what I was going to do next, but I found that there's almost always something, you know, that we can do. Let me see if I've got, I want to just do this. Let me, let me just finish up here. So I, I know I don't want to keep you too long. Here's the, you'll get 101 companies that we've researched and you guys have maybe already done that on the web uh, where, where people are doing business. Here's the top 10 from that list. Cleaning, oh, I'll let you read it. Cleaning companies, schools, mm -hmm. so forth. Gardening products. Do you know anybody that started a garden this year for the first time? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, me too. It's kind of been fun. We kind of compare notes. Healthcare, of course. Home improvement is huge also. People are spending, like, do you drive by your local Lowe's? Yeah. You know, that's true because I picked up a new client um, for a website design, and he mentioned to me that he wanted to get some polos. So um, that is true. I've forgotten about that home improvement. They do um, kitchens and baths. My Lowe's parking lot looks like it's the day before Thanksgiving every, almost every day. It seems <laughs> that people are fixing up their houses and they're, they're staying home. Um, mm -hmm. Hey, I did see something on the news the other day that some hotels, like the, maybe the Econo hotels that don't have bars and restaurants, you know, you know the ones, um, mm -hmm. and they are doing more business now. People that are itchy to go and, and, and they can social distance and they, they don't let somebody go into a room the next day. They have one day of where they're cleaning it. So every other day that room is booked. And I forget which company that was, like Comfort Inn or something like that. Yeah. Local uh, hotels, and they're, they're big with you know, take home products, I think. So that's just, so those are some, those are the top 10, but you'll get 101 here in the next day or so. Um, so so here's the reminder, there's a, there's a social selling uh, website here. 
And if you can't take this down or it won't copy for you, I'm going to send this. There's, we have a new tool that's called um, um, building a social network. And it's something you can work on if you have the right tools and sort of the right focus. And we're going to try to give you a blueprint if you want to step up in that arena. And perhaps we all could do that a little bit. Um, one other thing before we go, and I'll thank you for being here. Um, it, it, somebody said, let's talk, let's talk about e-marketing, e email. What we did um, a couple of weeks ago with one of our clients, we asked them to send uh, an email to their you know, 10 or 20 or 30, the people who said maybe, you know, a month ago or two months ago, or even five or six months ago. And in the subject line, we just said this, anything changed? Question mark. I've got the quotes out of line. Anything changed? And that was the subject. And then in the body, we just said, should we, should we talk? Or are you still thinking of, or have, have, you, have, you, have, you, have you done anything regarding? And we, got, uh, we did it in a, a workshop, and um, some of the people that did this while we were there got people re responding to them. They just rekindled. Um, so keep it simple. Uh, one, one word, subject line, or two, or anything changed. If you're trying to gather in or recapture a customer, it's a real valuable and clever and unique a bit. And keep it simple and focus on what they talk to you about. Be careful about saying, hey, we've got something new. Mm. You can do that, but then the doctor's telling me he's going to take out my gallbladder before he knows it hurts. <laughs> I don't like that, do you? No. <laughs> you can always follow up with a call, too. The anything changed um, subject seems to work. You try it. Send it. Pick 10 people that said, you know, let me think about it and go back to them or 20 or as many as you can. Those that were where you've got a relationship, they didn't slam the door and uh, they wouldn't mind hearing from you. So emails, it's a long process. I'd get a little help on that if you're not sure what to do. We use a constant contact so we can send emails out in a drip campaign and keep, keep it in front of people as long as we're bringing value. We don't always sell with our emails. You know the old adage, make a friend first, sell them something later. So maybe ideas, maybe, maybe it's a news flash, maybe it's something a customer did, maybe, maybe somebody in your community is doing some great things to feed the homeless. You know, it can be anything to reach out to show that you're involved, you engage, you're part of the community, and you're a thought leader when it comes to marketing and advertising and getting people. Here's something we try to teach to do a pre-call checklist. When, we, when I've talked with especially on, on e, remember emails and e-commerce uh, e and Zoom meetings. Remember three minutes, you've got maybe even less than that to make a good impression, but people are deciding really quick. So since you've only got that one shot and it's hard to get people to the phone, it's hard to get people to come to meetings, it's hard to people get, get people even to tune into Zoom calls, be as prepared as you can and stand out from the crowd. Think about what you're trying to accomplish, who's going to be on the call, how much time do they have available? Did, did you ask for 30 minutes in advance when you set the appointment? What decision are you looking for during the meeting? Be the best prepared of all the people that call them. We do this, we call it an upfront agreement. Before we, before we set a meeting, we, we appreciate that people are gonna meet with us. That's the AA. Thanks, thanks, Kurt, for setting the meeting, I appreciate it. The N stands for naturally, you're gonna have a lot of questions and I want you to get all your questions asked. And obviously I'm gonna have some questions, that's the O. And I wonder if you still have 30 minutes like we talked about. Is that still okay? Let's talk about the time. Most of us don't ask for the time we need when we set a meeting. We just hope, have you ever gone to a meeting after driving for an hour? And the person says, hey, you got five minutes, Steve. What do you got for me, pal? <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you're sitting there with your stuff on your lap and your coat on and there's no time. So it's called A-not. It's called an upfront. Try to get some agreement on what the meeting's going to look like. You get a chance, I appreciate it. You'll get a chance, I know you're gonna have questions. Obviously, I'm gonna have questions. Today might just be that. Maybe we don't draw a conclusion. Is 30 minutes still okay? A real quick agenda, and you can set those on the phone before you do a Zoom meeting. Don't go to a meeting if the time hasn't been agreed upon, if you can help it. And then you're not treated equally. Five minutes, three minutes, show me what you got. Oh, hey, I'm out of time. I'm out of time, Robert. Do you mind sending me your stuff? <laughs> uh, don't you hate it? Yeah. This is some of the stuff we teach. Okay. I'm going to express to the end here because we're out of time. 
we're going to be back next Tuesday. So join in if you can. We'll talk about some of these things. And we're going to talk about just dealing in difficult times. Pre-call checklist, post-call checklist. We'll bring those up next Tuesday so that you, I don't hold you too long today. So, so build relationships for now. I know you need business now, but keep building the relationships for next week and next month too. You'll need business then too. This is all about relationships and trust now. Next week is how to break the rules and sell more. So we're going to talk about some of these things, but how to do it a little differently, how to see it a little differently, how to come at it from a different angle, how to be different from all the other people that are competing with you and how to build relationships, how to build rapport and how to build trust in that early minute or two or three. I know you guys are good at that, but there's some things you can do to take it up a notch, I believe. Um, and I didn't want to do any selling during this, these, these hours, but we're going, to, uh, we're going to do four programs for, for Kurt and Kayser and Blair, and I hope you come back. And then we're going to give you a chance to subscribe to them. We're going to keep doing something every Tuesday. And if you feel some value from it, I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Or if you say, hey, Steve, I want to know more about how I could stay involved throughout the year. Maybe not for you every Tuesday, but that you could plug in when you want or when you need or when you see a title you like. Just email me, uh, steve.cashdollar at sandler.com. And I'll, I'll tell you what's, what's upcoming and, and how you can keep playing. And um, so thanks so much. Thanks to Kayser and Blair. I really appreciate it. Thanks for your patience at the first uh, when we, we couldn't connect very well there, but I think we caught up and good luck to you. Stay well, stay healthy and reach out to me anytime you've got my email and I'll send you a, rem a reminder for, uh, before next Tuesday so, and, and um, look forward to catching up with you. Uh, four different topics, four Tuesdays. And thanks so much for doing this, you guys. It's good to meet you. Thank you. You too. You too. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Bye. Thank, Take thanks care, for, everyone. Bye. Take care.